Banjul is the capital city of the Gambia, a very old settlement which was established in 1816 by the British. After the abolition of the slave trade in 1807, the British wanted to find a settlement or an island where they would be able to have a view of all the all the ships that were plying or leaving the river Gambia and going to the Americas and Europe. That is that was what led to the discovery of Banjul uh, as an island. They came and settled here, built a garrison, decided to bring people, or they brought in people from Senegal, mainly Walo, Salum, uh, Gore, Barnyi, you name it. They brought them. Uh, some of them were laborers that paved the roads, they built houses, uh, they built boats, they dug uh, wells uh, to give people water and things like that. Welcome to the special edition of the history of Banjul together with Banjul Diemba. Banjul had about four settlements. You had Avdai, which was known as Moka Town. You've got Jolof Town. You've got Portuguese Town. You've got Soldier Town, where the soldiers, where the British regiments were based. On the left hand side here used to be the British cemetery. Most of the British officials that died uh, in the Gambia or while serving in the Gambia were buried here. Many of them were uh, exhumed in 1995 when this massive arch which serves as an entrance to the capital city was built. Some of them were transferred to the Christian cemetery in Josuang, uh, some in Carnifin and others at the uh, Christian war cemetery or the British war cemetery. On the right here you've got the grounds that used to hold the oldest prayer ground where Tomaski was led, Korite was led, and things like that. Further up the road, this used to be called Clifton Road, and on Clifton Road, you, you've got Masjid Usman today, which is also one of the oldest mosques in Banjul. The land was donated, apparently, by Abari Konkogei, one of the early settlers that came to Banjul. This is the National Museum of the Gambia which used to house the first Batos Legislative Council. When we go in, you will see the big old structure that was built by the British. The people that used to sit here were the Gambians that together with the elected representatives from the British establishment that represented Gambians. The Legislative Council symbolizes the National Assembly today. This very structure housed the representatives that represented Gambians during the colonial era. We had people like Mam Usman Jeng, who represented the interests of Banjulians and Muslims, the Muslim community in this legislative council. We also had Seho uh, Omar Fai, the great uh, politician as well, who was here in the 1930s representing Gambians. Today it houses the National Museum. Before that it was the National Library. This is the very structure that houses today the national treasures of the Gambia, basically all the old all artifacts that uh, uh, represented Gambia in general. There is a well which is still in, uh, effectively used by Banjulians. Uh, it was dug by one of the earliest settlers of Banjul, somebody called Konko Abari Gay. The well is over 200 and, uh, 207 years old. Uh, it, he was brought in by the British to dug a well because when they, set, when they established Banjul in 1816, there was hardly any running water. So one of the facilities they wanted to see was something like uh, a well that would be able to offer Banjulians water. You've got a statue of rustlers. Rustling is one of our national sports. We've got the unknown soldier as well, which symbolizes the revolutions in 1994. We've got a halam player, which is one of our traditional instruments, which is made with uh, a little clubbers and uh, three strings, normally played by the futankes and again by the wolves as well. We've got the kora which is a 21 string instrument made out of a calabas with a hide and, and again there is, uh, there is a big wood that holds it in the middle. Uh, it's played by the, by the jellies now uh, and it was also discovered here in the Gambia over 500 years ago at Sani Mentereng by somebody called Korea Musa. Obviously the statue of Kumba Banjul as well. This is the 
Anglican church that was built by the British. This church was their place of worship. It's the Church of England in the Gambia, which was built in 1900. The importance of this particular ground is where they buried the people that were killed in the Sankandi bottle in 1900. There were quite a few officers that were killed in Sankandi and buried on this very ground. Uh, this particular site on this very ground, it used to have quite a lot of cotton trees. It had what they call Bentenke as well in Wolof. Uh, trees that they build, the British believe led to the deaths of quite a lot of uh, British soldiers that were settled in soldier town in this part of Batos or Banjul. Um, that been the reason, that been the case, they cleared quite a lot of the trees that were on this ground and then built uh, a church that, uh, that they use as a place of worship. Uh, majority of the people that were settled here were obviously British and they belong to the Church of England, hence the reason why they're here. What I wanted to show is this particular headstone. This is the one I'm referring to. This particular headstone um, represents or oh, it's the burial site of uh, some of the people that were bear, uh, that died at the Sankandi battle uh, during the conflict. I think it was the during the Soninke Marabu war and the incident that happened on the 14th of June 1900. As you can see the names, quite a lot of the other ones that were also uh, that also died were buried in uh, at the where the where the arch is and they later got transferred to uh, the Fajara War Cemetery. When the British came, they were settled here. This area of Batos was known as Soldier Town. And this very big ground that was called the Makati Square, and later changed to July 22nd Square, is the demarcation zone. It was the buffer zone that divided where the British were between Clifton Road, quadrangle area to the state house. You've got their church, which is the Anglican church on the left hand side. And this particular path leads to where the governor, uh, the governor general was residing and again where the British soldiers were also based. The Makati Square or July 22nd Square as it was later known is the buffer zone that divided the people of Batos from where the British were residing. You have Portuguese town on the other end of the square which holds or houses the mulattoes, the senaras and people who were descendants of blacks and whites. You had Mocha town, you had Jolof town, Portuguese town, soldier town. These were the different communities within Batos that was demarcated by the British. This is where the garrison is. That's, uh, as you can see, that's the clock tower. Um, the clock no, no, no longer works. Uh, this is over 200 years old. The building is over 200 years old. It was built by the British military when they came and the clock used to ring every hour. Um, it used to signify and apparently everybody in Banjul or Batos then used to, used to hear the bell when the hour rings. It represents what we've got in London, the big uh, John. Uh, uh, that's what this tower also signifies. Further down is where you've got the residence of the former governor, which is today the state house where the president of the republic is based. One of the significant of the Makati Square, when the Gambia asked for its independence and had the independence granted on the 18th of February 1965, when Sir John Paul was the governor general, this is where Sir Dauda Jawara, together with some of the some of the first politicians i mean took the mantle of leadership when the union jack was drawn down and then the red white blue white green uh, flag of the gambia was raised up this is where it happened it used to also be the gathering point of gambians during the time of mam usman jeng one of the one of the elders of banjul when the governor general decided to stop uh, uh, one of the biggest cultural programs that used to happen, which was a Gama Sabar, for example, the people of Banjul protested against this. They went to their representative, Mam Usman Jeng, who is who lived just down the road on uh, Jengen on Allen Street. They met him here. He escorted them, took them all the way down. 
to the palace or to to where the the governor general's residence was and you know let them negotiate with the governor general when he came out the people of banjo were jubilant about that and when uh, the crocodile, the tensiling crocodile that tormented the people of Banjul, when this was caught by Samba, Samba Laube or Samba Fal, Samba Chubala as he was known, it was brought in here. The governor general had to come out and see the crocodile himself and the people of Banjul also gathered here to see that that all happened between the Makati Square and again uh, the place that holds the treasury today. This area is called the Bedford Place. It's the place that used to be the first prison in the Gambia, which was also built by the British. It used to be the gallery as well where uh, executions took place. Uh, this was part of uh, Portuguese town in Banjul. Uh, today it houses the Ministry of uh, Basic and Secondary Education. In front of me there, it's the Carols' family's home. It was the first house that had a proper flush toilet. As you can see in those days, it must have been um, a building uh, uh, in a very affluent area in, 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 in Bartos then. Uh, it was the Carrolls, uh, the family of Bora Carroll, uh, uh, Dr. Henry Carrolls, and you know, uh, that family that used to live in there. Apparently, it's one of the uh, oldest and nicest structures in Banjul. The Albert Market is where the asylum center used to be. It used to be the place where they house people that would flee from up country, coming to Batos and seeking asylum. The asylum cases were processed uh, there. Uh, quite a lot of people during the Soninke Marabu War, during the uh, Bara War, you know, all of these other wars, even even the Tuba Kota, uh, Tuba Kota War, people fled from different places, uh, from the Kings, from the Nyomis, from Jokadus, uh, to come to Batos and sought asylum from the British. This is one of the oldest houses in Banjul. As you can see, the old structures, the crinting. This is Jonen in Banjul. This very very settlement or very house had um, Sir Matiba came here when he came on asylum after his father Mabajahu sorted the asylum claim for him this is where he came Masar John apparently was given this settlement by one of the kings of Nyomi uh, apparently according to history it goes back from 17 late 1700s uh, up till now so the structure is quite old as you can see as I said it's one of the oldest houses in Banjul. It has uh, settled or allowed quite a lot of people that fled from Senegal and other places to settle here on asylum. When uh, Masar married uh, Lisa Jata from Albreda, one of his uh, wives, I mean this is the settlement where he lived, Said Matiba um, who was one of the local rulers and again jihadists from Salum came to this very own house um, when the uh, when the war started or broke up in uh, Senegal and uh, Sayer Mati uh, wasn't able to remain in Senegal uh, Mabajahu his father sorted out uh, a pre-arrangement that he made with the with the governor of Banjul or the governor of Batos then um, to accommodate or provide accommodation or shelter uh, to his son and this is where he came and this is where he was settled prior to Tony Blaine taking him from here and uh, taking him to the to the governor's residence uh, where he was later settled in Bakau. So this is one of the oldest houses as you can see in Banjul. This is the Havdai Mosque. This particular building, uh, this site was built in 1926 uh, during the era of Alaji Tafsir Funds for the building of this mosque was raised by the likes of Alaji Babu Samba, Gurgi Waka Tabara, Salo Linjeme, Tafsir Ibu Samba, father of Alaji Babu Samba, and many of the great men that used to live in Havdai. Most of the Imams here happens to be Imam Ratibs of Banjul as well. This is where the Ba family lives. You had the homes of Mam Samba Juf, homes of notable Banjulians or elders of Batos. 
that live in the Half Dai area. Half Dai, this very site, used to be called Moka Town. It wasn't until after the cholera epidemic in 1869 that it was declared and called Half Dai when half of the population died. Unfortunately, today, most of the houses have been consumed by the extension of the Gambia Ports Authority. That's the reason why most of the inhabitants have moved away to other areas. We have shown you some of the historical structures in Banjul, many of which were built by the first settlers of Banjul. Until I come your way next time, this was your presenter, Ibrahim Ajawo. This was the history of Banjul in collaboration with Banjul Demba.